In today's lesson, we are going to review carbohydrates. So we're still talking of very important compounds, essential for living, sweet and fattening. We are talking about sugars and we divided them into three categories. What were the types of sugars or saccharides that we said we had? Monosaccharides, disaccharides, and polysaccharides. The word saccharide means sugar. In a nutshell, in this chapter, we will study sugars, and as far as the monosaccharides, we're zeroing in, looking at three very important monosaccharides, and those are glucose, so GLU stands for glucose, FRU stands for fructose, and GAL stands for galactose. So those are the three monosaccharides that I asked you to study very carefully last lecture. There are three disaccharides that we also mentioned, and those were maltose, composed of two glucoses, sucrose, composed of glucose and fructose, and lactose. Tose is sugar in milk. Sucrose is normal plain sugar that you sweeten your coffee with. Lactose is composed of glucose and galactose. And I also said that we will look in this chapter at polysaccharides. So these are very large, complex carbohydrates. And in a nutshell, they're composed with thousands of glucose units, N-glucose units. And we'll look at what? Starch, glycogen, and cellulose. Okay, so that was a big outline of the whole chapter. And of course, besides that, we are going to look at tests. Tests. And, um, test for polysaccharides. Okay, so that's Roman numeral four. After we go through mono, di, and polysaccharides, we'll look at tests for sugars. The three monosaccharides, fructose, galactose, and glucose, we call them hexoses. A lot of these monosaccharides have the same ending. The ending is O-S-E, glucose, maltose, galactose, fructose, all in end in O-S-E. If I give you a sugar monosaccharide of only four carbons, and I put an aldehyde group for carbons with a CHO, C double bond O, single bond H, a lot of hydroxies in carbons two and three, carbon four has an alcohol, calvot, one has an aldehyde. This structure is a tetrose because it has four carbons, N's and O's, three hydroxy groups, one aldehyde. If I have specifically an aldehyde group, this would be called an aldo tetrose, as opposed to a keto tetrose. If I have an alcohol in carbon one, in carbon three, and in carbon four, and a ketone group in carbon two, that would be a keto tetrose. This right here, I will write with five carbons. One, two, three, four, five. Aldehyde group in carbon one, alcohol in carbons two, three, and four, and five. This right here is a CHO, C-H-O means C double bond O, single bond H, aldehyde group and five carbons, that would be a aldopentose. So aldopentose means you have an aldehyde group, sugar of five carbons, and it's a saccharide, OSE ending. Keto tetrose, ketone group, ketone as opposed to aldehyde, aldehyde, four carbons, OSE ending. Aldo tetrose again, aldehyde group, 
four carbons or with the ending. I'll show you a structure for glucose, fructose, and galactose, the three monosaccharides that were responsible in this course. I'll show you the Fischer projections. In glucose, fructose, and galactose, we have hexoses, meaning six carbons, sugar. So we're going to have either an aldehyde group or a ketone. In glucose, we have an aldehyde, so I'll write a CHO. And in galactose, we also have an aldehyde. So I can write a CHO or again, double bond O, single bond H. Same thing. In fructose, we have a ketone. So we have a double bond O in carbon 2, secondary carbon, as opposed to an aldehyde group. In glucose, in carbons 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, we have OH groups. Carbon 2 has the OH to the right, 3 has it to the left, 4 to the right, 5 to the right, and 6 doesn't matter. The other positions, of course, is hydrogen. In fructose, carbon 1 has an alcohol group. Carbon 3 has it to the left, 4 to the right, 5 to the right, 6, it doesn't matter. The other ones are H's. And in galactose, just like in glucose, the OH of 2 is the OH in 3 is to the left, the O left as well. 5 is to the right, and 6, it doesn't matter. So notice that carbon 3 OH is to the left in glucose, also to the left in fructose, also to the left in galactose, and notice that glucose and galactose are both aldehydes, and we do not have an aldehyde group, but we have a ketone group in fructose. This is a keto, hexose, and glucose and galactose are both aldohexose. Aldehyde group, six carbons sugar, ketone group, six carbons sugar, in the case of fructose, aldehyde group, six carbons sugar, in the case of glucose. Now, let's see what do we mean when we have the OH to the right or to the left. Why does it make a difference in carbon 3 when I put the OH facing left or right in these what's called Fischer projections of these monosaccharides? Let's take a look at chiral carbons. Chiral carbons make a parenthesis and address a term chiral or asymmetric carbon. If you have a carbon that's bonded to four different groups, a carbon is bonded to a hydrogen, maybe it's bonded to a bromo, maybe it's bonded to a chloro, and may maybe it's bonded to a CH3. That carbon that has four different substituents, a hydrogen is different from the chloro, different from the bromo, different from a methyl, that is an asymmetrical carbon. I have in my hand a model of such a carbon. You have a black carbon centered in your tetrahedral, and an H could be the white one pointing to the ceiling, a green one could be the chloro, then you're gonna have a methyl pointing towards you, and this other totally different substituent. That compound is asymmetrical. And if you think of putting this compound in front of a mirror, this is a mirror, the image of this compound in the mirror would be this one. The white is pointing to the ceiling, the green and the black are lined up, and the red ones are towards the back. This is the mirror image of this. This compound, which is a mirror image of this, if I take it out of the mirror and I try to superimpose it, I can't. You will see that I can maybe line up my black center carbons, my red and my white, but what happens to the black and the green? They're backwards. And if I try to line up the green and the black, then what happens to the white and the red? 
they don't. Okay, so this is a phenomenon that we haven't seen. When I do a mirror image, my chlorine, my bromo, my methyl, my H, they're all there, but the orientation in space, three-dimensional structure is different. And these are called stereoisomers. This is not a bizarre concept. If you just stuff for a minute and look at your right hand and look at your left hand, you pretend there's a mirror in the, the middle of the two, the right hand is a mirror image of your left hand. And if you walk around with two right hands or two left hands, you're in trouble because your right hand is different than your left hand. They both have five fingers and they look so similar, but they're different. They're chiral. They're not symmetrical. Nature has these compounds. This only happens when you have four different bonds in carbon. So I'm going to need a right glove to put into my right hand. And my left glove is not going to fit into my right hand. It's going to have to go to my left hand because they're different. Okay? Every time we have a carbon with such asymmetry, you have a chiral carbon. Yes? So, for example, if it was a carbon with two bromos, a hydrogen, and a C. Right. If it's two of the same, then it's not chiral. If I have two H's, an H and an H here, not that's not chiral. Or if I don't have four bonds. If I have a carbonyl, if I have a C double bond O, that's not chiral. So it's got to have four bonds, and each one of them has got to be different. Yes? So it'll only be chiral and a stereoisomer? No, anytime you have a <laughs> chiral carbon, that carbon, if you put it in, a, inside, in front of a mirror, that image is going to be an isomer of itself. It's a different. Right, any compound. Like, we've seen isomers, like we said one butanol and two butanol are isomers. They're different compounds, they have different structural formula, but they have the same molecular formula. That's one type of isomers, constitutional isomers. Then we saw cis and trans. Butene, there's a cis and a trans isomer for two butene. Now these are stereoisomers. This is a different type of isomerism. And it occurs when chiral carbons or asymmetrical carbons are present. Okay, so let me bring you back to glucose. Well, can you send yes. Exactly. We are going to do problem 5D right now. Problem 5D, you have good. How many carbons in your chain? Are we all in 5D? So you draw your five carbons. Now every carbon has four bonds. The very first one, are we all in 5D? D as in David. D as in David. The very first one has what? A CH. Two and an OH. So you spell them out. Spell them out. Instead of writing CH2OH, you're going to write H and H and OH. Show the bonds. Second carbon has a what? Double bond O. So that's a carbonyl. That's a ketone. Third carbon has a what? An OH and an H. Fourth carbon has another OH and an H. And the last carbon has another one of these CH2OHs, which we had on the top, which I can spell out as CH2OH. So this is condensed. This is not condensed. They mean the same. Is carbon number one chiral? And carbon number one and carbon number five are going to be identical. Are they chiral? No. Do they have four bonds? Yes. But are those four bonds different? No, because you have an H, which is identical to an H. So if you have an H2, that fellow is not chiral, and that fellow is not chiral. Not chiral. What about carbon number two? 
Not chiral, why? Because you don't even have four bonds. It has a double bond. What about carbon number three? Carbon number three has an H, has an OH, then it has this whole thing, and then it has this whole thing. And they're all different. So is carbon number three chiral? Yes. Chiral number three. Yes, carbon number three is chiral. Did you see that? It has four bonds. These are my four bonds. Bond number one, two, three, and four. So I'm zeroing on carbon number three. And you look at what those bonds are. One is a hydrogen, which is different from the OH, which is different from this whole thing, which is different from this whole thing. So there are four different groups. You look at the whole thing that they're bonded to. Not just the one Nix bond. It's the whole thing that they're bringing. Okay? So this could be a white ball and a green ball and a yellow ball and a orange ball. And they're all different. So is that chiral? Yes, that's chiral. What about carbon number four? And don't say yes or no until we've thought about it. Carbon number four is this guy. Does it have four bonds? Yeah. Yes. This is the first bond, second bond, third and fourth bond. Are they the same? No. An H is different from an OH, is different from this whole thing, and it's different from this whole thing. So is that chiral? Yes, that's chiral. Carbon number three is chiral. In nature, when life was created, light was hitting in such a way that only one of the two stereoisomers is found. In living organisms, only one of these two mirror images is found. To differentiate, since they have the same formula and the same everything, it's not like a cis and a trans that you can visually see the difference, or one butanol and two butanol that you can physically see the difference, you need some machine, like a polarimeter, to differentiate between a one and the other. One isomer is going to be called a D, and the other isomer is going to be called an L. In nature, only D stereoisomers are produced. How do we classify a D versus an L? Well, you look at the carbon next to the last. In this example, 5D, this is carbon next to the last. It has an OH group, and that OH group is facing to the left. So therefore, that guy is an L. So you look at the carbon that's next to the last one. The last one's not chiral, but the carbon that's next to the last one is carbon four. That fellow's chiral. And if the OH is pointing to the left, that's an L. What about glucose? I pointed you a minute ago, glucose. One, two, three, four, five, let me erase the word hexose and rewrite this because it's this is carbon number six that fellow is not chiral but the one next to the last is what carbon number five is the o is that chiral or not chiral yes, yes it's chiral because it has four different groups NH and OH this whole thing carbon four three two and one is bonded to to five and carbon 6 is bonded to 5. And they're all different. Is the OH pointing to the right or to the left? So that is D-glucose. This is D-fructose. This is D-galactose. The last one is never going to be chiral. But in a sugar, yes. Because in sugar, we define sugars as polyhydroxy ketones or polyhydroxyaldehydes. Every carbon has an OH. And the ones at the end... The very last one, it's not going to be chiral. But carbon 1, is carbon 1 chiral in here, in fructose? Chiral 1? No, because it has two H's. Carbon 2? No. Carbon 3? Yes. Carbon 4? Yes. Carbon 5? Yes. Carbon 5, you need to draw the H. And carbon 6? H2OH. I no longer have to condense it because I already know that there's two H's. That's carbon 6. 
Carbon 6 is not chiral. So what's next to the last carbon 5? Is the OH is pointing to the right, which it is. It's a what? It's a D. And if it's pointing to the left, it's an L. And let's fix this guy, which also got messed up. Galactose. C, 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 H, 2, O, H. Is this D or L galactose? We look at carbon number 5. Carbon 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. The OH is pointing to the? So it's a? D galactose. D galactose. In nature, we only find D galactose. We can only metabolize in our body D isomers. We do not get any benefit nutrition wise from the L ones. Our enzymes won't recognize it. It's like you trying to put a left glove in your right hand. It doesn't fit. Our enzymes don't know what to do with these guys. They're pointing in the wrong place. The bonds are totally different. Okay, so D versus L. Are we okay with chiral carbons? So we need two conditions and they need to be addressed. You need to have four bonds and they all need to be different. So that's why these structures were drawn like this. These are called the Fisher projection. Now I need all of your undivided attention because I need to move you from Fisher to Howard projection. I am going to tell you what glucose does every day. Every I'm showing you a model of glucose in my hand. And I'm only putting carbon 1 with the oxygens and carbon 5 with the oxygen. This is glucose. Glucose is not stiff like the Fisher projection indicates. Glucose curls and twists. And carbon 5 and carbon 1 bump into each other. This again is carbon 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. This is a chain of six carbons, one, two, three, four, five, six, a hexose. I'm only showing a carbon-oxygen bond on carbon one and a carbon-OH bond on carbon five. When the molecule curls, I can, can curl to the right. Carbon one and carbon five OH bump can curl to the left carbon 1 and carbon 5 OH bump and it when it does that we're going to form a bond between carbon 1 and carbon 5 through this oxygen so this oxygen and carbon 5 is bonded to 1 and carbon 1 carbonyl turns into an OH so that is the ring structure of glucose. Carbon 1 has an OH being curling to the right or to the left ending as alpha or beta. Carbon 2, 3, 4, 5 and carbon 6. So 5 and 1 are bonded. Carbon 1 has a carbonyl group and aldehyde and carbon 5 has an OH and they bump into each other all the time. So that is going to trigger a ring formation. This is what happens. We're headed towards Howard's projection, but let me tell you the reaction first. If you have an aldehyde, like C double bond O, single bond CH3, single bond H, and you react that with an alcohol, any alcohol, C O H, HHH. These two react and what you form is a hemiacetal. The aldehyde group, this double bond, is going to open. And by opening that double bond, that oxygen is going to grab this hydrogen over here. So we're going to get an O red H. And the other bond, let me just make this red. This is red. So this 
is going to grab this other bond is going to grab this oxygen with whatever it's bringing and it's just bringing a CH3 that right there is what happens between an aldehyde and it also happens with a ketone and an alcohol this is called a hemi acetal okay so the aldehyde group opened we no longer have an aldehyde group we have an alcohol group and you also have like an ether group right there all in the same card now glucose does that within the same chain so listen up instead of writing let's write glucose open chain fissure projection for glucose C, 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 4, 5, and 6. Yes? Got 6 carbons down? Now put an aldehyde group. Double bond O. Carbon 2 has the OH to the right. Carbon 3 to the left. Carbon 4 to the right. 5 to the right. 6 is not chiral, so I don't have to spell it. I usually don't spell one, I just write show. But I need the double bond showing up here because I'm going to react it. Now I'm going to, instead of doing it like this, I am going to do this. I'm going to curl it. So I am going to not even draw the H's. This guy is identical. This is carbon one. This is carbon two, three, four, five and six this is glucose curling curling up of glucose and this double bond O let's make it red <laughs> double bond O is gonna open and by opening that is gonna grab this is carbon 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. This is carbon 1, 2, oops. Oh, first let's draw glucose again. 3, 4, 5, 6. Let's just draw glucose again. And carbon 5 has an OH group, right? I'm going to write it in red because those are the two that are changing. Okay, so that's glucose and that's glucose still. Nothing changed. I just curled it. And I didn't write the other OHs. I'm just pointing out carbon 1 and carbon 5. Now the reaction between the aldehyde opening up the double bond that we just saw and the alcohol loosing the H is going to happen. And this is what's going to happen. When this is a chain of six carbons, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, a hexose, I'm only showing a carbon-oxygen bond on carbon-1 and a carbon-OH bond on carbon-5. When the molecule curls, I can, it can curl to the right. Carbon-1 and carbon-5OH bump can curl to the left. Carbon-1 and carbon-5OH bump and it when it does that, we're going to form a bond between carbon 1 and carbon 5 through this oxygen. So this oxygen and carbon 5 is bonded to 1, and carbon 1, carbonyl, turns into an OH. So that is the ring structure of glucose. Carbon 1 has an OH being curling to the right or to the left, ending as alpha or beta, carbon 2, 3, 4, 5, and carbon 6. So 5 and 1 are bonded. Carbon 1 on the top hits, and it can curl to the right or it can curl to the left. It just curls. Whoops. When they curl and they hit each other, carbon number 5 is carbon number one two three four five carbon number five is going to bond 
to carbon number one. And the H that used to be here is going to go to the carbonyl group. So you have a ring. And this is how it looks when you close it. You're going to have your ring. Let's do it in blue. And once you understand this one, everything else is easy. <laughs> it's just this little guy that's connecting carbon 5 with carbon 1. And carbon 1 now has an OH group. So this opened and that bond grabbed that oxygen. That bond grabbed that oxygen. And that H went down there. Carbon 6, nothing happened to carbon 6, so that's still there. CH2OH. And carbon 2 had the OH to the right, so that's down. Carbon 3 had the OH to the left, so that's up. Carbon 4 had the OH to the right, so that's down. And carbon 5 no longer has an OH because you form a bond there. It just looks huge and crazy when you use the Fisher projection. So that's why you need to curl it to see how these two guys are together. This is an H. That H went here. That is an oxygen. Okay, so that is, this is that oxygen right there. That oxygen is that oxygen. So you cannot write a hexagon like you wrote in your cyclic alkanes because when you write this, you write a six-member ring of carbons, but in here I don't have a six-member ring of carbon. This is an oxygen, and that oxygen is that oxygen. Then everything that was on carbon six goes to carbon five. No carbon six, nothing happened. Carbon six is up there, bonded to five. Five closed with one. One and five closed. Six, nothing happened. Okay, so again. It is a bizarre thing, so you need to look at the models. You must look at the models. This was carbon 1 with the aldehyde group. This is carbon 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. And I'm stripping everybody from the oxygens except for 1 and 5. 1 and 5. Not 6, not 4, not 3, not 2. 1 and 5. When these guys curl, these two react. And when they react, they bond. So I form a ring between carbon 5 and carbon 1. And this that used to be a carbonyl is now an OH. This used to be a carbonyl. This used to be a carbonyl. Now that's an OH. That's carbon 1. 6, nothing happened to 6. It's still out of the Yeah, it's still there. That's 6, that's 6, that's 6. 6 is bonded to 5. Nothing happened to six. Six is just watching the whole thing take place. Okay? So I said don't even look at that page in the book because this you need to see models. This is called alpha glucose. Glucose is opening and closing and opening and closing millions of times every second. Just like you blink and you move and you breathe and you're still you. Okay, so alpha glucose is the exact same thing that this structure that I had here, the glucose. If when you close it, you don't go from the front, but you go from the back. Instead of producing alpha glucose like that, you are going to get a six-membered ring. But the, again, the oxygen, I'm making it red so you don't ignore it. That's the oxygen that used to belong to carbon 5 hydroxy. This is carbon 5 and this is carbon 1. This carbonyl that carbon 1 had is now a hydroxy group. Okay, and I think it was red. Wasn't it red? Let's put it red. So once you understand that this is all glucose and that glucose Carbon 2 still has it down, carbon 3 has it up, carbon 4 has it down, carbon 5 has no OH, it has carbon 6 on it. All you do is memorize. If the OH is up, it's beta. If the OH 
is down, this is down, it's what? Alpha. So what's glucose? This is glucose. And that's the Fisher projection of glucose. Open, but if this guy right here reacts with this guy right here, they form a bond. They form a ring. And you get not the Fisher, but the Howard projection. And when you close, you can either put the OH beta or the OH down, and that's alpha. Yes, let's drill that. Let's go to... It does both, okay? So you blink and you're still you, isn't it? It's not that, oh, you're a different person because you just blink, no longer you. You move around, you're still you. You move your arms, you're still you. Well, glucose opens and closes and it's still glucose. And sometimes it opens from the front and sometimes it opens from the back. It goes like this or like that. <clears throat> and that's going to result in an alpha or a beta. Okay, so you're looking at the, this carbon right here is called the anomeric carbon. This guy right here has an OH, that carbon right here, that carbon has the OH pointing up, that's beta. And that's the one that has a single bond oxygen carbon 5. Okay, look at page 200, exercise. 3A. Is that alpha or beta? Alpha is not beta. 3A. 3A. I have a six member ring. This fellow is up. This fellow has CH2OH. Carbon 2 has it down. Carbon 3 has it up. Carbon 4. Five has no OH, but carbon four has it up. Who's that? That's beta, but what? Beta what? Beta who? Beta galactose. It's three that has it up and four has it up. Remember galactose? Did we read? Every time I move this, this molecule's move. Galactose 3 and 4 as opposed to glucose 3 and 4. When it's to the left, it's down. In galactose 3 and 4, have it to the left. So that's the Howard structure of galactose. Beta galactose. It's beta because it's up. Do we have an alpha structure in there? Which one? 3A, B, C, D. Which one? B. B. Okay, so let's draw B. What's B? B, I have a six-member ring. So draw your six-member, but we'll write an oxygen. You cannot write anything but. Carbon six is flying up there. Carbon four has the OH down. Carbon three has it up. Carbon 2 has it down, and carbon 1 has it down. Who's that? Alpha or beta? Alpha. Alpha who? Who's this guy? Carbon 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Who's this guy? Carbon 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Beta what? Alpha what? Glucose. That's glucose. Okay, so what I said is last time I ask you to memorize glucose Fisher because we need to start there we need to know that glucose has six carbons one two three four five six that carbon three has the OH pointing in a different direction than carbons two four and five those are your chiral ones those are the ones that matters if it's to the right or to the left and it's only three that's backwards Wherever you have it to the right, once you close your ring and you, your Howard, instead of putting it right, you put it where? You put it down, yes. And whenever you have it to the left, okay, so in here, this was glucose. This is to the right, so this is down, bottom. 
This is to the left, so this is up. This is to the right, four is to the right, so this is down. Five has no OH. Five bonded to one. They're in holy matrimony. So glucose opens, goes to alpha, opens, goes to beta, opens, go to alpha, millions of times every second. They're all glucose. Alpha, beta, glucose is the same thing that the open chain. Are we okay with alpha and beta? Bottom line, if it's down, it's alpha, and if it's up, it's beta. Are we okay? When uh, fructose closes, it's, fructose is a ketone, so it's carbon 2 and carbon 5. So now we're no longer going to have a 6-member ring, we're going to have a 5-member ring. Okay? So, example 3D, is that alpha or beta? 3D, where do we look at? Alpha, because the OH in the anomeric carbon is down. So alpha, the OH is down. Beta, the OH is up. And it's the OH at the end. The OH at the end of your ring. Okay. Any questions in there before I move on? We know alpha and beta? Yeah? Alpha down, beta up. I want you to have a thought in your head. Remember when you were a little kid and you went to the circus and you had elephants coming out on the floor and the trump of the first elephant grabbed the tail of the second elephant? Did you ever see that? Get that thought? Okay. Glucose for us is going to be an elephant. Okay, so we're really stretching our imagination. This is... You're going to draw glucose... 50 times until you know glucose is this guy, this is an elephant with a big eye. And this is the trump of the elephant. And this is the leg of the elephant. This is the tail of the elephant. And this is the happy elephant, so it's hopping, that leg is up. And carbon six is up there. So you draw this many times, and that's glucose. Alpha or beta? What's this? Alpha, because this guy's down. Now draw me another glucose again in another color. Draw me another glucose in red. <coughs> so you go your ring. And you go your trump. And your first leg. And your happy leg. And your tail. And your CH2OH. I can't believe I'm recording this. <laughs> and it's going to go on YouTube. Okay. <laughs> and now... Remember when we dehydrated two alcohols and we form an ether? Yes? Some faces tell me we don't remember, man. Bimbo. This is what I'm talking about. Last week, we had an alcohol, HHH, and another alcohol, COHHHH, and we formed an ether. We dehydrated number the red guy and carbon blue fellow were now connected. C H H H is now bonded to the blue oxygen with a carbon H H H. Yes? We formed dimethyl ether or diethyl ether. That was low temperature dehydration. Okay. Same thing's gonna happen here. If this dehydrates what are we going to form? And I'm going to go down. The H of one carbon, so I'm going to remove HOH. Removing HOH. I am going to form what? My first little elephant fellow with Carbon six flying up there, its tail, its happy leg. Carbon two has an OH down. And carbon one no longer has an OH. It's going to be bonded to who? To that red O over there. So I am going to connect my O. And this is carbon four of my next one. See, it's not so hard. We just wrote glucose for the fourth time, and it's sinking in. That's all it takes. 
practice makes perfect. This right here is not an elephant holding another elephant. This is a disaccharide. <laughs> Formation of a disaccharide. You have two saccharide units, a glucose bonded to another glucose. This right here, if I have glucose plus glucose, glucose, that was glucose, alpha glucose, plus alpha glucose, who's this guy guys? Glucose plus glucose gives you? Maltose. So you just drew the structure of maltose. So you start with the open chain Fisher structures of glucose, realizing that we can draw them. Okay, so you start like this, glucose is one, two, three, four, five, six, carbon one has a double bond O, carbon two, three, four, five, six is of no interest, carbon three has the OH backwards, and everybody else. You start there, and you write it a few times until it sinks, and then you go galactose, you flip three and four, put the fourth OH in carbon four to the left as well. And then you do fructose, you do this guy with a ketone group. And then you close them and you remember that those are glucose as well. Okay? If you don't have glucose and glucose together, this right here is a bond. And it's between carbon 1 and carbon 4. And it's not called an ether bond because we're so fancy now. We're going to call it a 1,4 glycosidic bond because it's carbon one of my first glucose and carbon four of my second glucose that's forming that ether bond so a glycosidic bond is an ether bond that's all it is we're just calling it a fancy name now uh if this uh yeah where plus water you can write that or minus water i wrote minus water on the arrow if you write it on the arrow, you don't you really shouldn't write it anywhere else. This is a dehydration. So it's dehydration of alcohols. So you first learn alcohols with just one carbon, methanol, and dehydrate them, and then you are dehydrating glucose. What about if I don't have glucose and glucose, but I have galactose and glucose? Who am I going to form? Who's galactose and glucose? Lactose. Thank you. Those that you read, you're happy that you're following. More memory. What about if I have glucose and fructose? Who do I have? Sucrose. So this is simple sugar, what you had in Halloween a couple days ago. And it's a simple sugar, it gave you energy, and in 10 seconds, not 10 seconds, but maybe 15 minutes, you had no energy, because it only has two saccharide units bonded together. You get a high, and then you get a low. Maltose, lactose, sucrose are all disaccharides. If you dehydrate two glucoses, you form maltose. Galactose and glucose is lactose. That's the sugar in milk. Glucose and fructose is sucrose. Not so bad? It's a glycosidic bond. This right here, it's an, that's a carbon and that's a carbon. We used to call them an ether bond. Okay. So this chapter is a lot of memory. You start by memorizing glucose. And I ask you to memorize glucose, galactose, and fructose. And you have two days to do that. And a lot of us did and a lot of us didn't. But we will tonight. Okay. Now, remember that thought of the you at the circus with the elephants grabbing the tail of one elephant and the um, trump of the other one? Get that image again. Now, many elephants come. 
So you have a glucose and another glucose and another glucose and another glucose and another glucose. So what are you going to get? This is what I just showed you. This is maltose and pretty. <laughs> D-glucose, this is carbon number one. Carbon number two, three, four, five, six. The OH down. This is carbon number one, two, three, four, five, six. And that right there is an alpha 1,4 glycosidic linkage. That's alpha maltose. Okay, and that is in page 203. Hmm? Fructose is a ketone. So now it's carbon 2 and carbon 5. So it's a five member ring. Okay, any other questions? Okay, so imagine that this happens not with two glucoses. You form maltose and another glucose comes in. Like you have a string of pearls and you put the first pearl and the second pearl, that's two pearls. And then you add a third and a fourth and a fifth and a sixth and a seventh and you have a lot of pearls together. But except they're not pearls, they're glucose molecules. So you go from this, was maltose to another glucose and another glucose and another glucose and another glucose and if you do this a thousand times you have starch is your first poly what saccharide so what does a polysaccharide mean polymer composed of many monomers of glucose. Glucose and glucose and glucose and glucose and they're all bonded via, what is this called? 1,4 glycosidic bond. So you hear all the time, we should eat complex carbs. You should eat oatmeal in the morning, cereal in the morning, pasta, brown rice. These are starches. You have thousands of glucose molecules, molecular weights of hundreds of thousands. And that, every time you cleave one of these glycosidic bonds, you get energy. So you eat oatmeal in the morning, you're gonna have energy for a while, not for 15 minutes. If you have a piece of candy in the morning, you're gonna be very weak 15 minutes later. I'm sorry? Tastes much better. No, it's just a matter of getting used to it. Just put some cinnamon in your oatmeal, some raisins, whatever you like. <laughs> okay. And remember that you are doing this for you, for your body. If you are giving it junk, then your body is going to be composed of junk. And that's not a very good thought. <laughs> okay. So you want to give it complex carbs. So we said this earlier, we eat potatoes, we eat rice, we eat cereal, we eat starches. We metabolize and we break every one of these bonds. We get ATPs every time we do that. We get energy to live, to move, to dance, to go to school, to jump around. Then we metabolize them all the way down to carbon dioxide and water. And once carbon dioxide is exhaled from your body, the potato plant grabs that carbon dioxide and grows another potato. And there's a wonderful cycle going on which is the carbon cycle. Okay, so you are exhaling carbon dioxide and your starches are being produced by the plants to give you more potatoes or more wheat or more oatmeal or whatever it is that you eat. Not so bad? Are we okay so far? So this is my elephant number one, the trump and the tail of the next one. Trump on the tail, trump on the tail. And these are all happy elephants lifting the legs. That's one form of starch called amylose. There's another type of starch called what? Amylopectin. And these names have full mouth. Now you have what you had before is here. 
alpha 1, 4, alpha 1, 4, alpha 1, 4, and they're all alpha because they're pointing down. And these little squiggly lines means that you have many more starches there. I just don't have room in this page to write more. But carbon 6, guess what? Carbon 6 had an OH, right? Carbon 6 has an OH all over the place. So of every 20, 25 units, carbon 6 bonds to a carbon 1 OH, you're going to have a branch. That is called a branch. It's an alpha carbon 1 and carbon 6. Okay, so every 20, 25 units of glucose, you have a branch. And that's another form of starch, amylopectin. Not so bad? You're understanding what you're eating? Now, it turns out that we went out and we had a little bit too much pasta and a little bit too much bread. I love bread or rice. I love rice. And we consumed all these starches, and now I am full of glucose in my body. What do I do with them? I need to store them. I need to make my own polysaccharide that humans and animals have. So I'm going to make my own polysaccharide with all these loose glucose that are floating all over the place, and I am going to make glycogen from it. So my second polysaccharide, starch was number one, Composed of amylose or amylopectin. My second one is glycogen. This is the storage polysaccharide. For humans and animals. And it's very similar to amylopectin. Very similar. So it has alpha 1 fourth and it has what else? Alpha 1 6. So it's carbon 1 bonding to carbon 6 of another glucose and carbon 1 bonding to carbon 4 of another glucose. The only difference between glycogen and amylopectin is it's in our body and we branch every 10 units. You need a lot of branches. Branch, branch, branch. Very, very highly branched. So every 10 units, you have a 1, 6. Then you have 1, 4, 1, 4, 1, 4, 10 times, and then another 1, 6. As opposed to amylopectin that it has, it occurs every 20 to 25. Not so bad. And who's this guy right here? This is number 3. Cellulose. I'm giving you the structure of cellulose. Already done. What do you see the difference between this and the previous ones? Are my OHs pointing up? No, they're pointing down. So these are what? Beta 1 fourths. So if originally at the beginning of the class you were saying like, who cares if this OH is up or down? Well, this is who cares. If you go outside and the grass, that's cellulose. You eat cellulose, you eat grass, and it doesn't kill you, but you can't digest it. Cows can. They have hormones that can figure them out. But you get this fellow with a sticking up OH in your body and your enzymes are going to go like, okay, what do I do now? It is not going to be metabolized. Cellulose is fiber. Fiber is wonderful. Cabbage, celery, vegetables, fruits and veggies are full of cellulose. You do not metabolize them. But one of the big killers, cancer second cancer killer in the world is colon cancer. This is a must for your diet because it cleans you. It goes in one end, out the other. You don't break it down, but you don't let any toxic materials get accumulated in you. So instead of having candy, how about grabbing an apple or some celery or some cabbage? Have good food and I'm telling you what they're composed of to do your body good okay uh, questions in the three types of polysaccharides yes good point tell me differences I like differences between who do you want amylopectin and glycogen what are the differences 
amylopectin and glycogen. Differences and similarities. I like that game. Let's go there. Amylopectin <laughs> and glycogen. Difference, this is more branch. Glycogen is every 10 and amylopectin is every 20 to 25. What are some similarities? They both have polysaccharides, so start easy. What else? They're both polymers of glucose. glucose. Okay. They're both um, start um, polysaccharides. I said that. Polymers of glucose. Okay. And you can play this game not just with amylopectin and glycogen, but you can play this game with any other two. Cellulose and amylose. I don't know. Just pick any two and test yourself. Did I get it? What is the difference between cellulose and amylose? Cellulose has beta 1 fours. That's fiber. Wonderful for you. But we don't metabolize it. We do a house cleaning. Okay, so if you don't clean your house ever, it's not very good. Well, imagine what you can do with your body if you never have fiber. Okay, and amylose has what? Alpha 1 fours. Okay, last thing in this chapter are tests. You've done this in um, lab. Benedict's iodine and blood sugar are the three tests that you need to know. We did this in lab. Benedict's was a blue solution, yes, and it was positive for reducing sugars. Glucose gave you positive Benedicts, right? Who's a positive Benedicts? Glucose, positive Benedicts. Because glucose has an aldehyde group and the aldehydes got oxidized to what? Who remembers? Carboxylic acids. Benedicts did that. And the blue color of Benedicts turned orange. So we've seen that before. Okay? Who else is a positive Benedict's. Um, galactose is a positive Benedict's. All monosaccharides are going to give you positive Benedict's. The disaccharide that doesn't give you is sucrose. Sucrose doesn't give you a positive Benedict's. Iodine test is for polysaccharides. For polysaccharides. Iodine was brownish, and when you add it to starch, it turned what? Blue black. I don't care if you add it to amylopectin or to amylose or to glycogen. Iodine, the br brown color, turns blue black. Read the blood glucose levels. That is right down your alley, and it's at the very beginning of the chapter. You monitor the amount of sugar that uh, your blood has, and this is super important. Malfunctions will trigger. Um, hypoglycemia or hyperglycemia if you have too much or too little sugar yes so we're reading I'm sorry sorry uh, the blood sugar is at the very beginning of the chapter we saw that at the beginning of the chapter last time okay so this is all there is for the carbohydrates have a wonderful day I'll see you next time